So we're at the uh, AAS meeting 235 in Honolulu, Hawaii, and 3,500 astronomers are presenting all of their latest space science news. And I had a chance to hang out with uh, my good friend Ethan Siegel here at the conference, and I thought I would just throw an entire question show his way, all of the questions I've been avoiding, all the zingers, all the really hard questions, I'm gonna let Ethan tackle them. So, Ethan, it's your show now. That's my, that's what I get. I'm being, I'm the bona fide astrophysicist who does science communication. Let's see what we can do. I've got a series of questions coming my way. Hit me with them and let's see what we can do. Micros Chandran. Hey Fraser, do all stars, including our sun, travel through the Milky Way galaxy at the same speed? In order to do that, we have to compare how our sun moves over time with how all the other stars we can observe move. Now we know our sun is orbiting the center of the Milky Way at about 220 kilometers a second. We're making a nice elliptical orbit. And the stars in our vicinity, they seem to rotate at around that speed, but in our vicinity, about plus or minus 20 kilometers a second. So about 10% of our motion in either direction is what we see most stars do. Doing. If you go closer into the galactic center, stars there rotate faster. If you go farther out from the galactic center, stars there rotate, I would say, not just necessarily slower because the rotation curve is pretty flat once you get away from that central bulge, but there are bumps in the rotation profile. So you can actually see there are some radii where stars tend to move faster and some where they tend to move slower, again, by about this 10% amount. Mega cube. How is a photon its own antiparticle? When you take a look at what makes a particle versus an antiparticle, there are two things that they have in common. They have their masses in common, and they have the magnitude of all of their quantum numbers in common. But for every antiparticle, it's going to have all the other quantum numbers flipped. So if you had a positive electric charge, your antiparticle would have a negative electric charge. If you have a positive spin, your antiparticle would have a negative spin, and so on for all the different quantum numbers you can imagine. What what makes a photon its own antiparticle is that photons are not only massless, but all of the quantum numbers that they possess, when you flip them, you still get a photon. There's no switch between a photon or an antiphoton. They have the same quantum numbers, even if you flip them all. Leaf tie. Will it be safe to observe Betelgeuse through a telescope when it explodes? This is really a question about optics. You can look at the moon with a telescope if you like, but you're not going to be able to see very much unless you put a lunar filter over it because of how bright that moon is for your telescope optics. If you want to observe Betelgeuse when it goes supernova, Betelgeuse, assuming it goes supernova, it's going to be as bright as the full moon. You can still get lots of useful data with a telescope if you want to look at it. But if you want to visually look at it with your own eyes, you'd better put a filter over it that can reduce the brightness to a point where it won't blind your eyes. It won't harm you in the way that like the sun's ultraviolet radiation will harm you, but you definitely won't want to look at it. Kent Linkletter. Do the stars twinkle in the Mars sky? The reason that stars twinkle is due to Earth's atmosphere. Now Mars has an atmosphere, but it's much, much thinner than Earth's atmosphere. So the stars do twinkle on Mars, but only at about 1% of the level that they're seen to twinkle on Earth. However, if you look very close down on the Martian horizon at the stars that are very close just over the horizon, you will see lots of twinkling, possibly if you see things within about three degrees of the horizon to the same level that they twinkle when they're directly overhead here on Earth. Paul Thacker. What are our options for seeing the universe prior to recombination about 370,000 years after the Big Bang? Gravitational wave astronomy, neutrino telescopes, what would it take to accomplish this and what might we expect to learn? So when you have recombination prior to this epoch, what's happening is you have ionized protons, other atomic nuclei, and electrons along with photons. 
Only when the universe cools through that phase can you actually start to get that light because those photons aren't smacking off of those charged particles, mostly electrons. So that's why recombination is that sort of wall. However, it's not a unified wall at one place. It's actually a very thick surface. There are some places that get fully recombined around 60,000 years earlier and around 60,000 years later than the median average point of where recombination occurs. So we can see a little bit before in some regions just serendipitously. Going before that, however, neutrino astronomy and gravitational wave astronomy both can give us signals from the much earlier universe. The cosmic neutrino background, that has its decoupling moment where it freezes out, where it no longer interacts with the other particles between about one and three seconds after the Big Bang. So if you can observe your relic neutrino signal, that's your window on the universe from a much younger point in time. If you observe gravitational waves, those were produced from inflation. That's what occurred in the first tiny fraction of a second before the hot Big Bang, about 10 to the minus 30 something seconds. And that last thing that you can observe, there's actually a whole bunch of nuclear physics that occurs. This Big Bang nucleosynthesis interaction that occurs when the universe is about three to four minutes old. We can not only observe today the leftover nuclear signals from that, but if in principle we got good enough neutrino observatories, we might even be able to tease out the fusion reactions that occurred back then by observing those neutrinos as well. David Huber. Starlink seems like it will be a huge hindrance to astronomy. How much can be mitigated with predictive and adaptive software filters? That is entirely dependent on how much lead time we have. When you say predictive and adaptive software filters, the big challenge for Starlinks is they do not have fixed trajectories like the other satellites in the NORAD tracker. Because they're going to be artificial intelligence controlled, really the best we can hope for because they'll be making continuous adjustments that are automated and not predictable and not distributable in a table, you're really going to have to have some type of real-time communication system that can give you second-by-second -second updates on where the Starlinks are and how their trajectories are changing. This is something that's really going to require probably something well beyond, you know, real-time software tracking because because these updates are going to happen too slowly for us to actually adapt our telescopes and optics. The best solution might be something that simply when it detects a starlight, when it detects a starlink, it closes the shutter until the starlink passes. Steve Lenores, what if all the measurements are correct for the crisis in cosmology? What does that mean? So for the crisis in cosmology, this is the Hubble tension the tension in the expanding universe, we have the fact that late time measurements where you look back and back from where we are today into the more distant universe gives a value for the expanding universe of about 73 or 74 kilometers per second per megaparsec. The value that you get for looking for early relic signals from the early universe, such as baryon acoustic oscillations or the fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background, those give a lower value by about 9% of about 67 kilometers a second per megaparsec. If both of those teams are correct, if there's not an error anywhere in that, then that means something is changing in the universe. Either something is changing about how light propagates through the universe, something is changing about dark energy or the expansion rate that's evolving in an unexpected and additional way over time, or possibly that a new species of energy is decaying, changing or evolving over time. There are really interesting theoretical possibilities and as many as you can cook up, as long as they give fundamentally different, okay, here's what we see at early times versus here's what we see at late times, you could make it work. It may even include decaying neutrinos. Shorsh, is there a mass limit for a star before it would turn instantly into a black hole? 
when you talk about a mass limit for a star before it instantly or directly collapses into a black hole, the answer is yes, but it's not that there's one fixed number. It depends on your star's composition. If your star is made only of hydrogen and helium, like the very first stars that we think formed after the Big Bang, you might be able to get stars all the way up to the thousands of solar masses and have those stars burn through their nuclear fuel and then collapse down into a black hole only at the catastrophic end of life. However, at higher metallicities, which is to say when your stars have carbon and oxygen and iron and all these other heavy elements that they're rich in, those stars don't really get above about 300 solar masses or so. It's not possible to form them larger than that. The best thing about direct collapse that I can say is we don't fully understand how and when it occurs. For example, in a big surprise to astronomers, the Hubble Space Telescope a few years ago went to observe a previous star that it had seen of about 25 solar masses. And while all the other stars in its field were still there, that star had disappeared. It was gone. It was as though it had directly collapsed because there was no evidence of a supernova anywhere. So as far as what makes a star directly collapse, there are a few things we know that can cause it. There are a few situations we can concoct where it occurs, but the universe, when we watch direct collapse occur, appears to be surprising us in some interesting ways. Synaptic impulse. If you have two quantum entangled objects and one object falls into a black hole, are the two objects still quantumly entangled? If so, wouldn't that be a way to probe and gain some kind of information about the interior of the black hole beyond the event horizon? Yes to the first question and no to the second. Yes, the pair is still entangled, which means if something falls through the event horizon of the black hole and its partner particle remains outside of the black hole, it is still subject to those same rules of quantum physics, where the quantum state of one and the quantum state of the others are in a superposition that's related. However, there is in physics, unfortunately, a quantum mechanical theorem known as the no communication theorem, which states that even if something happens to one pair of these entangled particles that causes it to have its state determined, the observer of the other particle will have no way to tell any information about what happened to this counterpart until a signal from this counterpart comes back, and that has to be at light speed or slower, to the other one. So you, outside the black hole, you can make this measurement of your particle, but you won't know enough about this other particle to know of anything interesting that happened to it. If you're setting up an experiment where, oh, this particle is going to go into the black hole, and if it interacts in this way, we know it's going to go down into this state. As soon as you do that, as soon as you force an interaction to mean something, that's an act that breaks the entanglement. So there's no communication, but once something falls in and something else remains outside, the entanglement is still there. Cameron Wood. How might matter reach the singularity of a black hole if time dilation essentially pauses you to the rest of the universe? Since black holes don't last forever, how would there be enough time relative to the falling matter to reach the singularity before the black hole evaporates away in a finite amount of time? This is a fascinating question and it only comes up because you're mixing two different frames of reference. If you're outside the black hole and you're watching matter fall in, what's going to happen is that matter will approach the event horizon asymptotically, but never quite reach it. Over time, it will get smeared out all across the event horizon, all of that information, while the final photons from it get more and more and more redshifted. However, you'll never see it cross the event horizon itself. What does happen, however, when enough matter does this, because a black hole, remember, is just a region of space 
from which light cannot escape, the more matter you have fall onto that black hole, the bigger the event horizon grows. So if I had a one solar mass black hole and I dumped another solar mass of material onto it, it would all get smeared out around that event horizon, which would now grow to be double the radius and would suddenly encompass and encapsulate all of that material. So that's how from the outside an event horizon grows. If you take a matter particle and said, I'm going to fall in and see what happens, even for a supermassive black hole, once you cross the event horizon, you would see no slowing down of time or anything. You would hit the singularity in a matter of seconds, in under a minute, even for the largest black holes we know of at all. SME self. Is there a way for an astronaut who is slowly rotating around the head feet axis to arrest that rotation without external help? There is this nasty rule in physics called the conservation of angular momentum. So if you're slowly rotating in space, you can either pull your body into a ball, which will cause you to rotate faster. You can extend yourself in one dimension that you're rotating larger, which will make you rotate slower. If you wanted to slow your rotation, however, you have to either push off of something or have the reverse of what we think of of an inelastic collision, which is where two things collide and stick together, you could have an explosion, which could be as simple as you grabbing something from your pocket and in the direction that you're rotating, exert that angular momentum, throw that mass with respect to your axis of rotation. That is a way to change your angular momentum. So if you're willing to shed a little bit of mass, you can impart angular momentum to it, and that's a way you can change it without an external source. ATL 530. Hey Fraser, if massive objects in space can produce gravitational waves by dragging space around itself, does space pull back? Is the body losing kinetic energy from this interaction? And if there's some kind of fluid friction associated with space, will that eventually slow all moving bodies in the universe to a stop? This is an interesting question. This is a question that basically asks, is the gravitational self-interaction of an object energetically lossy over time? And the answer is pretty much unless your object is a true point source which means you're not made of atoms, protons, neutrons, electrons, all of that stuff that physically takes up space, that's the only way you could have it not lose energy over time. If you are an object that occupies volume, then one part of the object the, will cause space to change its shape. A different part of the object will experience motion through that changing space, and gravitational waves will be emitted. On the longest time scales imaginable, everything will slow down in its motion and eventually come to rest due to the emission of gravitational waves. But most things, we won't even have black holes existing long enough to observe that for. All right, Ethan, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, took a lot of pressure off of me. Um, if people want to like read more of your work, uh, see more of what you do, where should they go? The best places to find me, I am starts with a bang. I write a six days a week column on Forbes. I'm also on Medium. I have a Patreon, the starts with a bang Patreon, where you can support me. You can listen to my podcasts on SoundCloud and find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr. Frazier, thanks for having me on the show. All right, thanks, Ethan.